cold today. I was not expecting that. What a wonderful prayer, honor today to receive that as unto the Lord. And I want to say Happy Father's Day to all our dads. One of the great honors is to have your children follow you in the ministry of Christ. My oldest son, Nathan, is in Minneapolis. He's still writing songs and singing for the Lord. Kyle, my youngest son, is here on staff, leading in worship, following the Lord. Matter of fact, this Wednesday night, Kyle will be preaching his first sermon to adults here in the sanctuary. So I'm excited about that as a dad. I'd like to invite anyone that would like to. Maybe you've never come on a Wednesday night. We have church on Wednesday night here at Harvest. 7 o'clock, Kyle will be sharing a message. His first message to adults. I'm excited about that. You know, when Kyle was little, 5, 6, and 7 years old, and you parents know this because kids just grow up too fast, but he was always waiting on Sunday morning to see what dad was wearing to church. And so once I put on my clothes, whatever I wore, guess who had to wear the same thing? And his favorite Sunday was whenever I wore my preacher's jacket. It was a jacket that I had. When I put it on, then he would run in his room and he would put on his preacher's jacket because he wanted to be just like dad. So I'm very proud of him, proud of both of my boys and just thrilled to be ministering today on Father's Day. It's easier for me to speak about fathers than it is for women to speak on Mother's Day. And why is that? That's because I'm not a mother. And I thought Pastor Rachel did a phenomenal job on Mother's Day bringing the Word of the Lord. Yeah. You know, one time, a little boy was asked to define Father's Day and he said it like this, Father's Day is just like Mother's Day, only you do not spend as much money on the presents. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, because some guy toys have pretty big price tags. And if you've ever looked up the word father in the dictionary, you're going to find that the word father appears just before the word fatigue and just after the word fathead. <laughs> I know guys get a bad rap from time to time, and I know that men, as men, we can't be bullheaded. And it's unfortunate that there are many times that we, we just don't say what we mean. Take, for instance, if a guy says this, it would take too long for me to explain it. What he really means is, I have no idea how it works. <laughs> or if a guy says, uh-huh, yes, dear, he means absolutely nothing. It's a conditioned response. If a man says, take a break, honey, you're working too hard, what he means is, I cannot hear the game over the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and if a guy says, I heard you, what it means is, I don't have the foggiest clue of what you just said, and I'm hoping desperately I can fake it enough so that you will not spend the next three days telling me I never listened to you. And finally, when a man says, that's not what I meant, he means if something I said can be interpreted two ways and the one of the ways makes you sad or angry, I meant the other way. <laughs> Guys, am I speaking the truth here or not? Amen. Okay. You know, words, words are important and vital in any language. And all that a father represents in society is extremely vital. To be a man of God is not easy, but it's necessary if we're going to touch a generation that's coming behind us. I know dads get a bad rap about some things, but I also believe that in the last days the Lord is going to raise up a generation of men who will lead in the home, in the church, and in their communities. Solomon knew this truth, and he said this in Proverbs 22. Train up a child in the way he 
he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. I trust you caught the words in the way. This verse reminds us that there is a way a father should lead. And if he does, eventually his children will follow his footsteps. So what is his way? Please allow me to share with you three things fathers can do to lead the way. And the first one is this. A father must lead with love. Write that down in your notes. A father must lead with love. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. This verse doesn't say, wives, love your husbands. Have you ever wondered why that is? I believe it's because a man should set the example of love in the home. Men of God should be lovers of Christ, their family, and the church. We need to mature in our faith and become the spiritual leaders that God has called us to become. Love is not an option. It is a mandate from the Lord. The example was, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And Romans 5 eight tells us, but God commended or demonstrated his love towards us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God's love reached down and lifted us up so that we might demonstrate His love to others. Men, we need to lead the same way Jesus led. We are the example of Christ. Some time ago I heard a touching story about a humble, consecrated pastor whose young son had become ill. After the boy had undergone an exhaustive series of tests, the father was told the shocking news that his son had terminal illness. This son of his had already accepted Christ as his Savior, so the minister knew that death would usher him into the glory of God. But he wondered how, how he could go into that hospital room tell his son that he would soon die. After earnestly seeking the direction of the Holy Spirit, he walked into that room with a heavy heart and he sat down beside his son. First he read a passage of scripture, and then he had a time of prayer, and then he told him that the doctors could only promise him a few more days to live. Then he asked his son, are you afraid to meet Jesus? And the little boy, after blinking away a few tears, said this, no, not if he's like you, Dad. Not if he's like you. This father has shown his son what being Jesus was all about. He had led the way with love. Secondly, we must also lead the way with prayer. A while back I read an article by James Dobson, the founder of Focus on the Family, and he had surveyed 1,000 Christian women. And he asked them this question, if your husband could do something meaningful for you, what would that be? Dr. Dobson found something in their responses that was truly amazing. You see, he thought, like most men think, that the response would be something like, I want to be, uh, I want my husband to be someone who's more in touch with their feelings. Or I wish he was a better provider and would spend more time with the kids. But that was not the response that he had received from these women. Do you know what they said? They said 98% of the women in the survey said, I wish my husband would verbally pray for me and my family. 
That was a shocker to him. What is it about prayer that transforms the hearts of people, especially our wives and children? You see, I believe prayer sets the stage. It sets the table for the Holy Spirit to bring a covering of God's love to help them feel secure and cared for. Man of God, when you pray fervently for your family, it lets them know something special is covering over them. Money does not provide this. Ego doesn't provide this. Popularity doesn't provide this. Even humor doesn't replace the need for your family to feel God's care and security that you provide when you pray for them. You know, I stumbled on this truth many years ago when my youngest son, Kyle, had become very sick. Some of you probably have heard this story, so bear with me. I had gone into Kyle's room to pray with him as I did each evening. Kyle had a high fever and he was really hurting. So I prayed the best daddy prayer I could pray. And I placed my hand on his little forehead and I spoke the name of Jesus over his life. I rebuked the sickness and prayed longer that night for him than I had ever done so before. When I was done praying, I began to lift my hand off of his little forehead. And right then, Kyle reached up with his hands and he grabbed my hand and he put it back on his head. Then he said something that touched my heart still to this day. He said these words, more prayer, Daddy, more prayer. Let me tell you, friends, in that moment, I got a hold of God. I put my hands back on his little forehead and I called fire down from heaven. Hallelujah. And I should say, Kyle did not receive an instant healing from the Lord that night. He still fought the effects of the fever and sickness in his body. But what he did receive that night was the assurance that somebody was praying for him. That his dad had brought the Holy Spirit's care and love into the room. Men of God, I encourage you to pray for your wives, to pray for your family, to pray for your friends. Prayer lets people know that God cares. That's what it does. I know I'm speaking to a hard audience today because if it were true, and I believe it is, most men don't pray at all for their wives and children. So I'm asking you to do something out of the box today. Prayer sets the stage for comfort and security. Dads, on this Father's Day, I'm going to ask you to join me in making prayer a reality in your life and in your home. It was three weeks ago that I woke up at 5 a.m. For those of you that know me, I don't ever wake up at 5 a.m. And I had a vision. And again, I don't have many visions. I actually think people that have visions all the time, they probably have too much pizza the night before. Or... <laughs> really only have two or three visions in my life. This one was so vivid, so real. Because I found myself in this vision, I had come into the church, walked into the sanctuary, nobody was in the sanctuary. But I noticed down front, there was a casket. And I thought that to be odd. Because 
I wasn't prepared for a funeral. But there was a casket right down front in our church. I don't know how you feel about caskets, but they make you uncomfortable. The casket was closed in my vision. And any time you see a casket closed, you, you immediately want to know, well, I, I wonder who's in the casket. You see, when I started in ministry over 30 years ago, the way the church provided for my salary was they allowed me to live in a home free of charge, but they didn't tell me where the home was going to be. The home was a funeral home. So I knew what it was like to live amongst caskets. But on this day, I walked down the aisle and I paused for a moment. And then I went over. And I lifted the lid of the casket. There was nobody in it. But there was this big sun in the casket. And it said, prayer has died. Prayer has died. And right then, I woke up. And I said, Lord, that can't be true. We pray. We pray for everything. He said, no. You got to resurrect prayer in this church. You got to bring it back to life. So from that day until now, I have set my heart on praying and seeking God. And I am asking for the leaders of this church, for men of God, to join me in prayer. To believe God that something will be resurrected because without prayer, nothing can happen in the kingdom of God. Let's not wait for our women to pray. Men of God, let's bring prayer to life. Let's bring it to life. Let's get a hold of the horns of the altar. Let's get a hold of God. And let's start praying like we need it. I don't want to see that vision again. The next vision I want to see is an altar full of people praying and seeking God for the souls in our community. Hallelujah. How do we lead? We lead with prayer. We set the example of prayer. And finally, this morning, we lead by living for Jesus. The Bible says they overcame him because of the Lamb's blood and because of the word of their testimony. They didn't love their life even unto death. Friend, your life once you encounter Christ, becomes your testimony for Jesus. It is your most important and valuable commodity. God saved you so that you might have a testimony. He knows all the people you're going to come in contact with from now until you leave this planet. Your testimony is valuable to God. And as long as we're alive on earth, we're going to have to fight the enemy and overcome his schemes. It says they overcame him. Well, who is the him? We know it's the devil, and this passage gives us a threefold battle plan 
to live for Jesus. It says, first they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb's blood. Who is the Lamb? Jesus is the Lamb. The way we overcome in this life is to place the blood of Jesus over our hearts and minds. Now men, we're all about the battle, the blood, the guts, the glory. Fighting is a part of our DNA. God created us to be soldiers in the army of the Lord. Anyone who's ever been in a battle knows there's going to be a little blood spilled on the ground. When I fought with my brothers who were older than I, we didn't stop the fight until we saw some blood, and then the fight was over. Now, I know the Bible says we don't fight against flesh and blood, but you need to know that doesn't mean that we're not in a battle. Throughout the book of Revelation, you hear the charge, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life. Revelation 2.11 says, He who overcomes will not be harmed by the second death. It says, To him who overcomes, I will give of the hidden manna. Revelation 2.26, He who overcomes and keeps my words until the end, I'm going to give him authority over the nations. Revelation 3.5, He who overcomes will be arrayed in a white garment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before the Father and before his angels. Revelation 3, 21. He who overcomes, I will give him the opportunity to sit down on my right hand on the throne of God as I also overcame and I sat down on my Father's throne. There's a, there's a theme that's going on here. Overcome, overcome, overcome. Don't tell me we're not in a battle today. <laughs> Every day we battle against the enemy who wants to kill and steal and destroy our lives. So how? How do we win? How do we overcome? The key is found in Revelation 12, 11. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. It's not my blood. It's not your blood that brings the victory. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Friend, you cannot win if you're not on the Lord's team. Amen. Some of you keep battling your problems, your addictions, your sins, because you do it in your own strength. This will not work. The only way you can overcome is by surrendering your life to Jesus and allowing His blood to give you power over the enemy. Why? Because there is power in the blood. My favorite hymn growing up was this, Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. But we'd sing it a thousand times until we got, until we caught the concept. You see, the day you swallow your pride and you surrender to Jesus, that'll be the day you begin to overcome and you secure the victory. That isn't the only way we overcome. First way is by the blood of the Lamb. The second way we overcome is by the word of our testimony. See, our testimony is all we have in this life. I have a testimony, and you have a testimony. And who is the word of our testimony? Jesus is the word. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word of our testimony is Jesus. The devil will attack your testimony as long as you live this life on earth. And how does he attack our witness, our testimony? He does so with fear. And what is fear? Fear is false evidence appearing real. That's how you spell fear. Let me break it down for you. The devil says you're not loved, but the Bible says I love you. The devil says you're never going to amount to anything in life, but God says he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The devil says you'll always be broke, but God says I'm going to supply all your needs according to my riches and glory. 
The devil says you're going to be sick. And the Bible says by his stripes I am healed. Hallelujah. The devil says your life is going to be filled with worry and terror and anxiety. But God says, oh no, I'm not giving you a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. See, our testimony is the word of God coming out of our mouths. That's why it's so important to memorize and meditate on the word of God. You cannot overcome the enemy without the word of God in your heart, your mind, and your mouth. The devil will tempt you just as he did Jesus. And how did Jesus respond? He responded with the word. Jesus said, it is written. I want everybody to say that. Ready? It is written. Say it again. It is written. Men, say it loud. It is written. Louder. It is written. And join with them. His word in our mouths becomes the testimony of our lives. You know, the world can argue everything with you about the Bible, and they do. But they cannot argue with you about your testimony. Amen. Jesus saved me. He forgave my sins. He lives in my heart. Allow me to share with you an incredible testimony about a man by the name of John Newton. John Newton, if I can have a little water on him, a little dry. Hey, bring Kleenex with you. We need a wet mop clean up here on all three. If you give me 10% more on that, that would be great. I have a muscle here and it wears out. And it's only the first service. I'm going to share with you a story about John Newton. He was a seaman. But he wasn't an ordinary seaman. John Newton was a captain of the ship. But it wasn't an ordinary ship. He was a captain of a slave ship. He was involved in the infamous, infamous African slave trade in the 19th century. It happened when Captain Newton held many of the vices that were common to most seamen of that day. He, he was a cursing, drinking, womanizing, man. That's who he was. And so when the ship would take the slaves from Africa to America, Captain Newton would get drunk and then he would rape the slaves. On one of his voyages, Captain John Newton carried a passenger from Africa. This passenger was a Christian and, and took the time to save or to talk to him about his faith in Christ. Oh, well, it didn't happen immediately, but Captain Newton eventually gave his life to Christ. He began to study the Bible and pray. He actually stopped cursing, stopped drinking, but he didn't stop running his slave ship. Oh, he picked up his terrible cargo and he set out for sea. And when he got out to sea, something changed in his life. Temptation and sin gripped his heart. And so once again, he would reach for the bottle and then a slave woman. This went on for months. 
But then something incredible happened to Captain Newton. One morning he woke up and instead of reaching for the bottle, he reached for his Bible. He opened the book and he came to the story of the prodigal son. When he read the story, the Holy Spirit came down upon him on that ship. And he fell on his face before God. And he repented of all the terrible sins that he had committed on his voyages. John Newton was transformed by God's power. And what became of his life? Well, the John Newton I'm talking about is the same one who penned the words of this poem. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. The testimony of John Newton has become the most beloved hymn of our generation. This man was transformed by the power of God, and because of it, we too can sing the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. <laughs> do you have a testimony to share? We all do. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and not loving their lives unto death. I want to quickly close by saying, not loving their lives unto death means they were totally sold out to Jesus. Not a quarter sold out, not a half sold out, not three quarters sold out, but totally sold out to the Lord. Can I tell you, mister, your wife and your children are waiting for you to man up. Well, you're a big man when it comes to competition and anger and yelling and swearing. But what about being a big man in your commitment to God? Do you love God with all your mind, your heart, your spirit? If not, why not? Overcomers are sold out. I heard a statement recently, a boy will love his mother, but he will follow his father. Mister, are you giving your sons and daughters reasons to follow you? Do they know that you're covered by the blood of Jesus? and have a word of testimony in your mouth? Do they hear and see you pray? Do they know your love? How do we overcome? We overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and not loving our life even unto death. And what makes that possible? <laughs> I want to end today by giving you the secret, the thing that unlocks the doors to help us overcome the enemy of our lives. The key is the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Nothing else I know works in this area. It's near impossible to love and pray and lead by example without a touch of the Holy Spirit on our hearts. Jesus knew this and he told his disciples, wait in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Today as we close this service, I would like to pray for the men of Harvest Church to be filled and refilled, to be ignited and recharged with the power of the Holy Spirit. So this is what I want to do. <laughs> I want to pray with you so the Lord will give you the supernatural ability to love, to pray, and to share Jesus with others. I'm going to ask for all the men in the sanctuary, just as I did earlier, to stand to your feet. Come on, men. Let's stand up. Let's make a stand. And now I'm going to ask for all the men of the church. I'm going to ask you to come and stand at the front of the platform. Just move out and come stand right across the altar. The Lord gave me a vision. 
The vision was prayer instead. We're going to change that today. We're going to bring prayer back to life. And I'm asking the men of Harvest Church to help me do this.